So we already talked quite a lot about speech input uh, last week. So um, maybe it's getting getting more accepted now. Uh, I still haven't seen a lot of people use it in public. Um, again, this might be also due to, to kind of cultural differences. In the US, people are more used to uh, to talking into their phones on speakerphone, for example, so they might also be more open to using speech input. But in Europe, again, I, I haven't seen it widely used so far, mostly in a car context. Actually, both, yeah, yes, please. Mm -hmm. But you mean voice messages, not text messages, right? Voice messages. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay, okay, because you said text messages. Oh. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, well, that's something I haven't encountered so much, but it's interesting to know that uh, people are actually using that. So I'm, I'm also using WhatsApp, but I haven't used that feature much. So maybe it's actually an age thing, I don't know. Um, but um, again, uh, speech input is actually quite capable and um, speech output also, but uh, the, the biggest scenario, uh, as far as I can tell, is still car navigation, both for input and output. But of course, voice me messages may, may also be becoming more popular. Um, one aspect which uh, maybe is also quite promising in this context is to combine speech with something else because uh, there are a lot of things which you can't really do well with speech. You can input text, of course, um, but uh, it would be quite difficult to edit a picture using speech. There's a, a actually quite old example in the movie Blade Runner where he's uh, more or less talking to his um, image processing program, but uh, I don't think that would really transfer well to, to common uh, image operations. And what might be a, a way to deal with that is some kind of multimodal interaction where you have different channels at the same time. For example, speech plus pointing. There's a really, really old example from 1980 which was called put that there and uh, so that combined speech to basically select the, the operation and pointing to um, select the spatial context. Uh, and that already contained quite a lot of, of uh, stuff which we use today, like uh, finger tracking, speech recognition. So it was actually quite complicated for that time and quite advanced. Um, and it was one of the earliest examples of using that kind of multimodal interaction which combines different channels. Um, all right, so we've already talked about speech uh, last time for a, a bit, so today I'd like to, to focus on vision. Again, vision can be used for both input and output. If it's used for input, then it's often called computer vision uh, and it uses the camera in the device usually. Uh, if it's for output, then it's uh, at first glance, it's just the display. Um, and if you merge both, then you get something like augmented reality where you have uh, visual input and at the same time visual output plus augmented information. Um, so maybe let's deal with output first because that's the well, absolutely most common use case. And before that, I'd like to give you a short overview of how uh, displays used in mobile devices actually work. So most screens we use are still LCDs, liquid crystal displays, and they're actually composed of quite a, a number of different layers. So this example is actually for, for the really old uh, seven segment displays, but the same technology applies to, um, to common LCD screens. Each, uh, each segment is just one pixel there. And uh, so the central element is this liquid crystal layer, it's actually a liquid, so if a uh, LCD screen gets damaged, then the liquid will actually leak out and uh, it, will, yeah, it will no longer work properly. Um, and the important property of uh, this liquid crystal is that it basically can 
rotate the polariz polarization of light passing through it. And it only does that when power is applied. So when no power is applied using uh, these transparent electrodes, then the light basically uh, gets blocked at the front filter because as you can see, it's illustrated here. So uh, we have a horizontal filter and vertical pol polarization of the light, then it simply gets blocked. And once power is applied to specific parts of that liquid crystal, then it will turn the polarization uh, vector and the light can pass through the filter and then the pixel lights up. So that's the basic mode of operation. Um, what's important to keep in mind is that uh, LCDs are actually monochrome by default. So every pixel which you can see on a, on a regular display needs actually to be composed of several sub-pixels and each one has a small colored filter in front so that you get red, green and blue uh, colors for one pixel. You actually have different sub-pixels. Uh, and if you know about the sub-pixels and the arrangement, then you can uh, use that to improve the, uh, to improve the resolution actually. Um, for example, to make fonts look uh, smoother. So if you ever come across subpixel rendering, that's what, what what's, uh, this is about. I've already mentioned most of this. Well, there's two, two additional things. Um, LCDs always require power to operate. So as long as they're supposed to show a picture, you need to put power in. And you also need a separate backlight. So uh, they don't light up on their own. Uh, you need some kind of LED or uh, other light source to actually produce the light that's then filtered by the, by the LCD. So the LCD by itself is just a, a light filter, basically. There's also uh, uh, so-called transflective LCDs, which can use light from the environment. So they're still readable in sunlight, for example but they consist of even more different uh, layers or even more complex to, to uh, construct and expensive therefore, and so they're not, not widely used. Um, there's also organic LEDs. That's probably something you have heard of and some uh, usually more expensive phones also use that kind of display already. Uh, in this case, basically every single pixel is its own light emitting diode, again in red, green, and blue. And so it doesn't, it can actually be, uh, it's actually simpler in a sense from, from in terms of construction because you don't need a separate light source anymore. The contrast is better because even with, an LC, with a good LCD, you still get uh, some kind of light leakage. So if you have the entire display in black, then still some light will come through. With an OLED, um, black is simply no light, so it's uh, as dark as the environment allows it to be. Um, and they uh, don't need to uh, power the backlight all the time, but each individual pixel just needs power when it's actually on. So they're also more efficient. Uh, they're also more expensive. This is why not every device uh, uses them currently. And as far as I know, they still have a lower total lifetime. So the time before the display, at some time the uh, OLED displays will degrade and get less bright. Um, that also happens with LCDs, but it happens far slower. So LCDs will can last for 10 or 20 years and OLEDs maybe last for five years. So um, that's still not, not as well usable. But I think it's like not fully applicable to mobile devices because in five years, every mobile phone just becomes so slow that it's that's a good, impossible to use. That's a good point. The, probably maybe the main reason why you still don't see them in every device is simply cost. So because they're still more expensive. Uh, especially, uh, maybe, maybe five, you're right, five years would be completely sufficient, but um, um, yeah, for some combination of these reasons, we, we still don't see them in, in uh, at least not in most devices. You can get them mostly from Samsung, but um, 
there's still, I don't know if it's maybe 10% of the, of the total market of displays, something around that. Okay, so now let's look into a completely different kind of display and how these work, that's e-ink display. So if you have a, a Kindle or some other kind of e-reader, then they will probably use an e-ink display and they work by a completely different, different principle. So they usually contain this small kind of uh, capsule which is transparent and filled with uh, some kind of oil. And in that oil, you get different uh, particles, white ones and black ones with different charges. So the ones are uh, charged positively, the others are charged negatively. And now if you apply uh, a different, uh, different charge to these electrodes, then the, um, the, the op opposing charges will uh, repel each other. No equal charge, charges will repel each other. And so for example, the uh, negatively charged black ones will get pushed to the top when you apply a, a negative charge down here. And depending on what kind of e-ink display you have, you can also do kind of grayscale if you apply uh, different uh, charges to the different electrodes, then you will simply get a different distribution of, of colors. The important aspect here is they only uh, actually need power when they change their state. They don't need power to uh, maintain their state. So, um, for example, they have actually been used for price tags in supermarkets, uh, which you just have to update uh, maybe every few weeks. And for the time in between, they don't need any power at all. They can just uh, retain their uh, uh, the image more or less indefinitely. Um, the drawback is they, um, they are far slower because you actually have this physical movement of the little, little colored particles within that, uh, that oil-filled bubble. Um, so they're far slower in terms of update rate. So you can't, for example, really show video on such a display. Uh, you can mostly just show text and maybe grayscale images. Um, but for anything moving, everyone who has a Kindle will know if you flip the page, then it will uh, take maybe half a second and it will briefly flash, you know, flash up to refresh the page and then you get the new image. So video is completely um, out of the question here. But the big advantage of course is that it uses far less power. In fact, what I've seen just a few days ago, which I find quite interesting, was a small e-ink display which um, you could power just using the NFC reader in your phone. So you could stick that somewhere, then update the content of that e-ink display using the, the phone and the NFC reader, and then go away and it would simply keep its content for, I don't know, years, because it wouldn't actually use any power at all while it's just displaying what you, what you put on there. So sort of like a, like a sticky note. Okay. So, yeah, one question, please. Question from one comment. I, I got the feeling that it's just way more sensitive because, like the screen, I don't know if it's my, because of manufacturing or my usage, but mm. I, I got two Kindles, like, screen broken. Like, okay. No, no more usage. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I think, um, E -ink, so at least the e-ink screens in Kindles are also uh, laminated on glass. So they're at least as sensitive as, um, as an LCD screen. And um, many phones now use some kind of hardened glass, which is of course thicker. I think for the Kindle, the glass is maybe simply thinner. So that might be why they're, uh, they're more sensitive. But um, yeah, in, in terms of manufacturing, I'd say they're about equally, equally resistant to, to, to damage. So there's nothing integral which, which makes e-ink more sensitive at, as far as I know. All right, other questions regarding display technology? Okay. So now let's briefly look into uh, 3D displays. This is also th something which is relevant to mobile, maybe not as much, but uh, still interesting, I guess. So uh, 
the, the primary approach to doing 3D displays is to simply get two different images to the left and right eye, so you get this stereo view. The problem usually is that uh, the human brain uses a lot of lot more different uh, depth cues, so uh, information that helps you estimate depth. So there's the stereo disparity, this is the primary one, just the difference between left and right view. That's simple, you just have to create two different images. Then you have parallax, so if I move from side to side, then things that are closer to me will move more. That's also something I can simulate. Uh, what's getting difficult is focus depth. So uh, my eyes can tell basically from how I focus if my hand is very close to me or if it's farther away or maybe if I'm looking at something at the back of the room. That's something the eye will uh, adjust for internally. But usually with uh, 3D displays, uh, the distance I'm focusing on will always be the same. Even if the other depth cues tell me that something is far away, uh, my eyes will still tell me it's one meter in front of me. That's not something I'm really able to, uh, to process uh, consciously, but subconsciously it will not match. And that will often cause people to, to get headaches, for example. Um, What's also uh, still not, not very widely used is that I uh, actually can, can move my, uh, my entire body or walk around and the view will move accordingly. So most, uh, at least most virtual reality applications are currently optimized uh, towards be just being used while you're sitting in a chair. Uh, you can maybe still uh, move your, uh, your head, but the rest, uh, isn't, isn't tracked so well. It's, there's one exception, which is the HTC Vive, but that only gives you a few meters of, of range at most, so still not very mobile. Um, what's the, uh, so what different ways of doing that, that kind of primary separation between left and eye do I have? So there's auto stereoscopic displays. You can get some niche mobile devices which have a display like that. So where you really get a 3D view even if you just hold the device in front of your eyes. And there's um, basically two different approaches to do that. Um, there's either a so-called parallax barrier in front of the screen or there's a, a grid of lenses in front of the screen. And both uh, have, the, have the task of simply separating view for the left eye and view for the right eye um, so that they don't mix. Um, yeah, this, uh, I've already written it there. The big problem is that this only works for one single person and only if it's basically in the right position. So um, some devices actually are able to move that barrier a little. So you can move your head, but then of course you n somehow need to know the position of the user's head relative to the device to probably adjust that, that barrier or these lenses. Um, and it's getting even more difficult if you want to support multiple users at the same time because then you would actually need two barriers or you would need even more different views back here in the, in the main screen. So um, this again is something that's possible in theory but um, it's not working very well in practice. You can kind of get one single person to work, but then you would have to hold the device at a pretty specific position and uh, also keep your head pretty still, so that's not really well suited to, to mobile applications, actually. Um, the other way would to use an, an HMD. You can, of course, put your mobile device into one. Um, that has kind of been a little, little revolution in terms of HMDs uh, in the last few years, thanks to the Oculus Rift. So uh, before that, HMDs were either really bad in terms of uh, picture quality or really expensive. And what most HMDs before the Oculus Rift tried to do was use two small screens right in front of the eye and then use some really expensive, complex optical system so that the user can actually focus on that, 
on that small screen. Because if I put something right in front of my eye, then I'm not able to, to focus on that anymore. So I need some kind of additional optics that it looks like it's a big screen, maybe one meter in front of me or something like that. And the trick or the, the, the smart idea that the guys at, at Oculus Rift had was that they could use one simple smartphone screen and use just one single low quality lens and compensate for the, uh, for the distortion which that lens would, would introduce, compensate for that in software by distorting the image. So if you've ever seen the image that's, that's um, rendered on an Oculus Rift, for example, or on any other HMD, then you will see two, two views side by side, which are pretty strongly distorted, have this, this pink cushion form. Um, and that's simply to compensate for what the the simple lens uh, in, the, um, in the HMD will introduce in terms of uh, distortion. So that, that was the, the kind of smart idea which uh, really lowered the, the price by, I don't know, a factor of 10 maybe, and which kind of made we are uh, into a sort of a mass product. Yeah, that's still, so I think the, the rule of thumb is currently that you need at least 90 frames per second and you also need the tracking to work at, at the same frequency. So uh, then if, otherwise if you turn your head and the image will, will lag behind, then this will also make people sick pretty fast. So this is of course still a big problem. Yes. Well, um, in a sense, it's related because you can, of course, get these kind of adapters where you can put in mobile devices, which just use the, uh, the screen of the mobile device. Um, I can talk about that for a, for a bit, so I didn't have a slide for that, but um, so the, the cheapest version, of course, is the Google Cardboard. I don't know if you've seen that. It's just a, basically a cardboard box and two lenses, and you can put your mobile in front and use that as the screen, and it will also use the sensors of the mobile to detect uh, rotation. But uh, that already gives you some of the problems which, which uh, Natalie just mentioned, that it will be quite slow. So if you turn your head, then it will lag behind. And for that reason, um, what you can you can get something like the Gear Gear VR from Samsung, for example, which is also just a, a, a holder with lenses for your mobile phone. But for example, it contains additional sensors, which speed up the tracking so that if you move your head, it gets faster. Of course, this still isn't mobile because you can't walk around with that. But um, if you look into augmented reality, for example, which we'll do in a later lecture, then you could actually use the camera on the phone, which, you're, which is right in front of your eyes, to take a picture of your surroundings, then put, on, put additional information into that picture, and then show it back to you in the viewer. So there are ways to um, use that with, uh, in a really mobile sense. And it's also possible to use the technology developed for mobiles primarily for VR, so that's the reason why I'm uh, bringing this up here. Yes, of but course. But probably if you have like a precise position tracking, mm -hmm. would be like exactly, exactly. So if you, uh, th that's exactly the point. So for for the if you buy the HTC Vive, then you're definitely not mobile anymore because you have a big cable connected to your head basically, and you have to. Uh, put these trackers into the environment. So uh, current solutions for, uh, for position tracking are definitely not mobile. So, and that's something a lot of people are working on, but it's not really, not really there yet. Okay, are there any other questions about displays and related topics?